The next sutta is 8.6.59. Monks, there are these eight persons worthy of offerings, worthy of gifts, worthy of oblations, deserving to be reverently saluted, the world's peerless field for merit. What eight? The stream winner. That's number one. Number two, he who has entered the path for the realization of the fruit of stream winning. Number three, the one's returner, or Sakadagami. Number four, he who attains to the path for the realization thereof. Number five, the non-returner, or Anagami. Number six, he who attains Ahu, he who has entered the path for the realization of the fruit of non-returning. Uh, number seven, the Arahan. And number eight, he who has entered on the path to Arahanship. That's the end of the Sutta. So here the Buddha is talking about eight persons uh, who are Aryas. And you notice uh, it is uh, eight persons, not four persons. Eh? Because in the Abhidharma, the path uh, attainment is supposed to be followed immediately the next moment by the fruition. But this is not so in the suttas. Eh? Uh, in the suttas, you have uh, eight persons, eh? which means that... Uh, path attainer actually exists for you to make offerings to. So uh, it does um, appear in the suttas that path attainment and fruition attainment uh, can take quite some time. They, uh, they are apart, uh, quite some time apart, not necessarily one following the other immediately. The other thing you notice is that these terms, Sotapanna, Sakadagamin, Anagamin and Arhan, are all fruition attainers. They are all fruition attainers. Here in this book they have uh, translated wrongly. Uh, they have translated um, the stream winner and he who attains to the realization of the fruit of stream winning. So from this translation it appears like the stream winner, Sotapanna, is a... Uh, path attainer, but actually uh, when I check the Pali translation, I find that the um, terms Sutapanna, Sakatagamin, Anagamin and Arahan are fruition attainers. The next sutta is 8.7.62. Monks, possessed of six qualities, a monk is enough for self, enough for others. What six? Herein a monk is quick to grasp the subtle doctrines or Dhamma. Number two, he remembers those heard. Number three, he reflects on the meaning of those remembered. Number four, knowing both the letter and the spirit, he walks in conformity with Dhamma. Number five, he has a pleasant voice, a good enunciation, is urbane in speech, distinct, free from hoarseness and informative. Number six, he is one who instructs, incites, rouses and gladdens his companions in the holy life. And then possessed of these six among his worth is enough for self, enough for others. I'll just stop here for a while and just to recapitulate. No? Um, there are six qualities which makes um, uh, uh, a monk, uh, which benefits a monk as well as benefits others. Uh. Number one, he is quick to understand the Dhamma. Number two, he remembers the Dhamma. Number three, he reflects on the meaning of the Dhamma. And number four, he walks in conformity with Dhamma. Number five, he has a pleasant voice. Number six, he is one who instructs uh, and encourages his companions in the holy life. Now to continue. Uh, likewise, uh, um, uh, possessed of five qualities, a monk is enough for self and enough for others. What five? He is not very quick in grasping the subtle doctrines, but he possesses the other five qualities. That means he remembers the Dhamma heard, he reflects on the meaning of the Dhamma remembered, 
And then number four, he uh, number three, he walks in conformity with Dhamma. Then he has a pleasant voice, and he instructs and encourages his companions in the holy life. Possessed of these five, he is enough for self, enough for others. Possessed of four qualities, a monk is enough for self, but not for others. What for? He is quick to grasp the subtle doctrines. He remembers those heard. He reflects on those remembered. Knowing both the letter and the spirit, he walks in conformity with Dhamma. But he does not have a pleasant voice, nor does he instruct, rouse and gladden his companions in the holy life. With these four, he is enough for self, but not for others. Possessed of four qualities, he is enough for others, but not for self. What for? He is quick to grasp the subtle doctrines, remembers them, but not he does not reflect on them or walk in conformity with Dhamma. Yet he has a pleasant voice, and he instructs his companions in the holy life. With these four, he is enough for others, but not for self. Possessed of three qualities, he is enough for self, but not for others. What three? He is not quick to grasp the subtle doctrines, but he remembers them, he reflects upon them. He walks in conformity with Dhamma. Yet he has not a pleasant voice, nor does he instruct his fellows in the holy life. With these three, he is enough for self, but not for others. Possessed of three qualities, he is enough for others, but not for self. What three? He is not quick to grasp the subtle doctrines, but remembers them. Yet he does not reflect on them, does not walk in conformity with Dhamma. But he has a pleasant voice and instructs his companions in the holy life. With these three, he is enough for others, but not for self. Possessed of two qualities, he is enough for self, but not for others. What two? He is not quick to grasp the subtle doctrines, does not remember them, but he reflects on them and walks in conformity with Dhamma. Yet he has not a pleasant voice, nor does he instruct and rouse and incite his companions in the holy life, with enough for self but not for others. Monks, possessed of two qualities, a monk is enough for others but not for self. What two? Herein a monk is not very quick to grasp the subtle doctrines. He does not remember those heard, nor reflect on the meaning of those remembered. Knowing neither the letter nor the spirit, he does not walk in conformity with Dhamma. But he has a pleasant voice, a good enunciation, is urbane in speech, distinct, free from hoarseness and informity. He is one who instructs, incites, rouses and gladdens his companions in the holy life. Possessed of these two qualities, a monk is enough for others, but not for self. That's the end of the sutta. I'm not going to go through those uh, qualities again. Perhaps if you have the tape uh, or if you remember, then you can reflect on it and slowly you'll understand. Uh. The next sutta is 8.7.63. A certain monk approached the exalted one, paid homage, uh, etc., and sat down and said, Lord, well were it for me if the exalted one would teach me Dhamma briefly. After hearing it, I would abide alone, secluded, zealous, earnest, resolved. And the Buddha said, But this is just how some foolish fellows beg of me, and when they have heard me preach Dhamma, they think I am just the one to be followed. And the monk said, Lord, let the exalted one teach me Dhamma briefly. Let the welfarer teach me Dhamma briefly. Perhaps I might understand the purpose of the exalted one's word. Perhaps I might, I might become an heir to the word of the exalted one. And the Buddha said, Wherefore, monk, you must train yourself thus. Inwardly my mind shall become firm and well composed, and evil and unwholesome states which arise and overwhelm the mind shall find no footing. Thus indeed, monk, must you train yourself. I'll just stop here for a moment. <clears throat> this advice the Buddha gave huh, is a very good advice. He's telling the monk huh, to 
make the mind firm and well composed so that the evil and unwholesome states of mind can find no footing to arise. Uh, that is the purpose of samadhi, strong concentration. Uh, and the pers- purpose uh, is that these hindrances, uh, these unwholesome states of mind uh, shall not arise because they have no footing to arise. Uh, uh. Now the Buddha continued, When monk, inwardly your mind is firm and well composed, and evil and unwholesome states which arise and overwhelm the mind find no footing, then monk, you must train yourself thus. Radiation of goodwill by the mind shall become made become by me, continuously developed, made a vehicle of, made a basis exercised, augmented, thoroughly set going. Thus indeed, monk, must you train yourself. When monk, this concentration is thus made become, and when monk, and sorry, when monk, this concentration is thus made become and developed by you, then you should make become this concentration with initial and sustained application. Make it become without initial application, but with sustained application only. Make it become without either initial or sustained application. Make it become with rapture or delight, pity. Make it become without rapture. Make it become accompanied by pleasure, sukha. Make it become accompanied by equanimity. When monk, this concentration is made become by you, and well made become, then monk, you must train yourself thus. Radiation of compassion, joy, equanimity by the mind shall be made become by me, continuously developed, made a vehicle of, made a basis, exercised, augmented, thoroughly set going. Thus indeed, monk, must you train yourself. When monk, these concentrations are thus made become and developed by you, then you should make these concentrations become with initial and sustained application, etc. Make them become accompanied by equanimity. I'll just stop here for a moment. So here you see the Buddha is advising the monk, uh, firstly, to make the mind firm and composed. Uh, then uh, after that he asks the, the monk to practice uh, radiation of goodwill by the mind, metta, goodwill or loving kindness, uh, uh, to develop the uh, metta. And then after that uh, to develop the concentration without Sorry, with initial and sustained application, that is vitaka and vichara, and then make it become without initial application, but with sustained application, then make it become without either initial or sustained application. That is the second jhana. With initial and sustained application is the first jhana. Without initial and sustained application is the second jhana. And make it become with delight or rapture, uh, pity, and then make it without uh, pity, and then make it accompanied by pleasure, accompanied by equanimity. These are different stages of jhana, going from the first to the second, to the third, to the fourth jhana, because the fourth jhana is a state of pure equanimity and mindfulness. uh. And then after that, the Buddha advised the monk to practice compassion, joy and equanimity, the other four Brahma Viharas, these are all the Brahma Viharas. And after developing the, uh, practicing it, uh, to practice the concentrations uh, one by one. Uh, Now to continue, uh, when Mang, these concentrations are made become by you and made well become, then Mang, you must train yourself thus. As to the body, looking upon the body, I will live strenuous, mindful and aware, overcoming the hankering and dejection common in this world. Thus indeed, Mang, you must train yourself. When Mang, this concentration is thus made become and developed by you, then make this concentration become with initial and sustained application, without initial application, but with sustained application, then without initial and sustained application, etc. 
When monk, this concentration is made become by you and well made become, then monk, you must train yourself thus, as to feelings, looking upon feelings, etc., as to the mind, looking upon mind, as to Dhamma, looking upon Dhamma, I will live strenuous, self-possessed and mindful, overcoming the hankering and dejection common in this world. Thus indeed, monk, you must train yourself stop here for a moment. So here the Buddha is advising the monk uh, after developing the concentration to practice the satipatthana mindfulness uh, with regard uh, to abide uh, uh, contemplating the body, contemplating feeling, contemplating mind and contemplating dhamma. These are the four objects of satipatthana. Mm. Then the Buddha continues, When monk, <clears throat> this concentration is thus made become and developed by you, then you should make this concentration become with initial and sustained application, make it become without initial application, but with sustained application only, make it become without either initial or sustained application, make it become with rapture, make it become without rapture, make it become accompanied with pleasure, make it become accompanied with equanimity. When Monk, this concentration is made become by you, and well made become. Then, Monk, <clears throat> just to whatever place you go, you shall go in comfort. Wherever you stand, you shall stand in comfort. Wherever you sit, you shall sit in comfort. And wherever you make your bed, you shall lie down in comfort. And the monk, roused by the exalted one's exhortation, got up from his seat, saluted the exalted one, and departed, passing him by on his right. Now not long after, dwelling alone, secluded, zealous, earnest, resolved, that monk attained to and abode in that unsurpassed goal of the holy life, realizing it by personal knowledge in this life, for the sake of which clansmen rightly go forth from the home to the homeless life. And he fully realized, birth is destroyed, lived is the holy life, done is what had to be done, there is more, no more of this to come. And that monk was numbered among the Arahans. That's the end of the sutta. So in this last part, <clears throat> the Buddha is again asking the monk to practice the concentrations in, in, uh, in stages, uh, very systematically. Uh, and then the Buddha says, uh, when he has developed up to the concentration accompanied by equanimity, which is the fourth jhana, then the Buddha says, uh, when this concentration is made become or developed by you and well made become, then monk, just to whatever place you shall go, you shall go in comfort. Wherever you stand, you shall stand in comfort. Wherever you sit, you shall sit in comfort. And when wherever you make your bed, you shall lie down in comfort. This is the result uh, of attaining the fourth jhana. Uh, in some other sutta, the Buddha has also mentioned this. Uh, and it shows uh, that the effect of samadhi lasts for a while. It's not that immediately you come out of samadhi, all the hindrances come back. And it is precisely because the hindrances are in abeyance uh, that this monk uh, can go everywhere in comfort. Uh. In comfort means uh, he's not disturbed uh, by the hindrances, uh, by the defilements of mind. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, in another sutta, it was quite plain, uh, the Buddha said, even an external sect ascetic, it's a mention of an external sect ascetic by the name of Sunetta, the Buddha said because he had developed the jhanas, uh, he was free of the passions, uh, uh, which are the, basically the hindrances. Uh, 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 so that's the end of the sutta. You notice uh, that the Buddha is a very systematic teacher. You see, he t talks about attaining the jhanas in very different, uh, many different levels. Uh. Uh, he's very, very systematic. You can see uh, he asked the monk to practice the first stage uh, with initial and sustained application. Then get rid of the initial application and go into that state uh, with sustained application only. And then after that, to go to the next stage uh, without initial or sustained application. And then after that, the next stage with pity. And then the next state without pity. And then the negate with sukha, pleasure. 
and then after the next state, after that, after dropping sukha, then you abide in equanimity. So you can see the Buddha is a very systematic teacher. He practiced very systematically and he taught very systematically. That is the um, one of the advantages of studying the suttas. Eh? Uh, we, we learn eh, to do things very systematically according to the teachings of the Buddha. The next sutta, 8.7.64. Once the exalted one was staying on Gaya, head at Gaya, and there he addressed the monk, saying, Monks, Lord, they replied, and the exalted one said, Monks, before my awakening, while I was not yet completely awakened, and but a being awakening, I perceived auras, but I saw no forms. Monks, to me there came the thought, if I were both to perceive auras and to see forms, seeing and knowing Jnana Dasana within me would be thus better purified. Monks, later on, living zealous, earnest, resolute, I both perceived the auras and saw the forms, but did, I did not stand with, talk to, or engage in conversation any of those devas. I just stop here for a moment. The Buddha is saying eh, that <clears throat> first he perceived the auras of these devas, eh, sort of a bright brightness of the devas, but he could not see the devas uh, properly. So he decided uh, that if he could both see the auras as well as see the forms of the devas, uh, then his jnana dasana, seeing and knowing, uh, would be better purified. And then the Buddha continues, Monks, to me came the thought, if I were to perceive the auras, see the forms, stand with, talk to, and engage those devas in conversation, knowledge, seeing and knowing within me would thus be better purified. Monks, later on living resolute, I did these things, but I knew not of those devas. These devas are from such and such a deva community. Monks, to me came the thought, if I were to perceive the auras and to know that these, uh, to perceive, if I were to perceive the auras, see the forms of the devas, and be able to talk to and engage the devas in conversation, and to know that these devas are from such and such a community, seeing and knowing within me would be better purified. Monks, later on, living resolute, I did all these things. But I knew not of those devas. These devas are the result of their deeds passed away from here and arose there. These devas also thus. I knew not such is the food of these devas, such their experiences, such their pleasure and pain of those devas also. I knew not these devas live so long, they have a lifespan of such length, those devas also. I knew not whether I had dwelt with those devas formerly or not. Monks, to, to me came the thought, if I were to perceive the auras, see the forms of the devas, talk with, engage those devas in conversation, know they are of such a community, know their faring on was thus because of their deeds, their food, experiences, pleasure and pain, their lives and lifespan so long, know whether I had dwelt with them before or not. Seeing and knowing within me would be better purified. Monks, later on, living zealous, earnest, resolute, I did and I did and knew all these things. Monks, so long as this eightfold series of seeing and knowing of the higher devas was not fully purified in me, I did not realize as one wholly awakened to the highest awakening, unsurpassed in the world of devas with its maras and brahmas, or in the world of mankind with its recluses and brahmins, devas, and men. But when the eightfold series of seeing and knowing of the higher devas was fully purified in me, then monks, I realized as one wholly awakened to the highest awakening, unsurpassed. Then 
Seeing and knowing arose in me, or knowledge and vision, and I knew, sure is my heart's release, this is my last birth, there is now no more becoming for me. That's the end of the sutta. This is quite an interesting sutta because it shows uh, that the Buddha here is using psychic power uh, as a stepping stone to full awakening, jnana dasana. And uh, <clears throat> and it is it is very clear from here that the Buddha cultivated the psychic powers uh, in stages, uh, and because of that, the Buddha said uh, he had the full awakening as a sama sambuddha. So this sutta contradicts uh, what some monks say about psychic power that uh, psychic power, that you should not cultivate uh, psychic power, etc. That uh, there's a greed, uh, that you might have a greed for psychic power. But here the Buddha is saying uh, that he is using um, the perfection of the psychic powers uh, to perfect his seeing and knowing, jnana, dasana, so that he obtained the full enlightenment of a Buddha. So, in the Buddha's teachings, uh, psychic powers uh, are part of the higher knowledges, abhinya. The Buddha talked about six abhinya, six higher knowledges, and five of them are psychic powers, different types of psychic powers. Only the last, number six, uh, is the destruction of the asavas. So, if psychic powers were not important, the Buddha would not have mentioned these five psychic powers uh, as uh, the higher knowledge, but because they are stepping stones to enlightenment, I mentioned them. Uh. Now, the next sutta is 8.7.65. Monks, there are these eight spheres of mastery, Abhiba Yatana. What eight? One, when personally conscious of body, anyone sees forms exterior to himself, whether limited, lovely or ugly. He is thus conscious. Having mastered them, I know, I see them. This is the first sphere of mastery. Number two, when personally conscious of body, anyone sees forms exterior to himself, whether boundless, lovely or ugly. He is thus conscious. Having mastered them, I know, I see them. This is second sphere of mastery. Number three, when personally unconscious of body, anyone sees forms exterior to himself, whether limited, lovely or ugly. He is thus conscious. Having mastered them, I know, I see them. This is the third sphere of mastery. Number four, when personally unconscious of body, anyone sees forms exterior to himself, whether boundless, lovely or ugly, he is thus conscious. Having mastered them, I know, I see them. This is the fourth sphere of mastery. Number five, when personally unconscious of body, anyone sees forms exterior to himself, blue, blue in color, blue in appearance, reflecting blue, he is thus conscious, having mastered them, I know, I see them. This is the fifth sphere of mastery. Number six, when personally unconscious of body, anyone sees forms exterior to himself, yellow, he is thus conscious, having mastered them, I know, I see them. This is the sixth sphere of mastery. Number seven, when personally unconscious of body, anyone sees forms exterior to himself, red, he is thus conscious, having mastered them, I know, I see them. This is the seventh sphere of mastery. Number eight, when personally unconscious of body, anyone sees forms exterior to himself, white, white in color, white in appearance, reflecting white, he is thus conscious, having mastered them, I know, I see them. This is the eighth sphere of mastery. Monks, these are the eight spheres of mastery. Uh, these are called the <coughs> Abhiba Yatana. The first one, eh? conscious of body, he sees external forms which are limited. Number two, conscious of body, he sees external forms, boundless. Number three, unconscious of body, he sees external forms, limited. Number four, unconscious of body, he sees external forms, boundless. Number five, 
unconscious of body, he sees external forms blue, all blue. Number six, unconscious of body, he sees external forms yellow. Number seven, unconscious of body, he sees external forms red, all red. And the last one is unconscious of body, he sees external forms all white. These four colors uh, are the four colors in the Kasina meditations. Uh, uh, and uh, these are the four out of the ten Kasina meditations, uh, meditation on colors. And these particular colors uh, are useful for that type of meditation, blue, yellow, red, and white. Uh. The next sutta is 8.7.69. Monks, there are these eight assemblies. What eight? Assemblies of nobles, of brahmins, of householders, of recluses, of devas, of the four royal devas, of the thirty-three devas, of maras and of brahmas. Now monks, I call to mind having visited many hundreds of times an assembly of nobles, of brahmins, of householders, of recluses, of the four royal devas, of devas of the thirty-three of Maras, of Brahmas, and before even I had seated myself among them, or had spoken to them, or had engaged them in conversation, whatever their color, that I became, whatever their language, that became mine. And I instructed them, incited them, roused them, and gladdened them with Dhamma discourse. And they knew me not when I spoke, but reasoned among themselves, saying, Who is this who speaks, man or deva? Then when I instructed, incited, roused and gladdened them with Dhamma discourse, I vanished. And they knew me not when I was gone, but questioned each other, Who is this who has vanished, man or deva? Monks, these are the eight assemblies. That's the end of the sutta. This is another interesting sutta where the Buddha shows uh, that he used his psychic power to visit various types of devas uh, and men. And um, he assumed their form and he spoke their language yeah, and he gave them Dhamma teachings. And then after that he just vanished and they were surprised uh, who they were. They were wondering who he was uh, and he just disappeared. The next sutta is... Uh, 8.8.74 It was at Nadika, in the brick hall, and the exalted one addressed the monk, saying, Mindfulness of death, monks, when made become, when developed, is very fruitful, of great advantage, merging and ending in the deathless. And how, monks, is it so? Take the case of a monk who, when the day declines and night sets in, he reflects thus, Many indeed are the chances of death for me. A snake or a scorpion or a centipede might bite me and cause my death. That would be a hindrance to me. I might stumble and fall. The food I have eaten might make me ill. Bile might convulse me, phlegm choke me, winds within me with their scissor-like cuts give me a shivering fit. Or men or non-humans might attack me and might cause my death. That would be a hindrance to me. Monks, that monk must reflect thus, are there any evil and wrong states within me that have not been put away and that would be a hindrance to me were I to die tonight? If monks, on consideration, he realize that there are such states, then to put away just those evil and wrong states, an intense resolution, effort, endeavor, exertion, struggle, mindfulness and awareness must be made by that monk. Monks, just as a man whose turban is on fire or whose hair is burning would make an intense resolution, effort, endeavor, exertion, struggle, mindfulness and awareness to put out his burning turban or hair. Even so, monks, an intense resolution, effort, endeavor, exertion, struggle, mindfulness and awareness must be made by that monk to put away just those evil and wrong states. But if that monk on review realized that there are no such states within him that have not been put away, that would, which would be a hindrance to him were he to die that night, then let that monk live verily in joy and gladness, training himself day and night in the ways of righteousness or wholesomeness.' 
Take the case, monks, of a monk who reflects likewise when the night is spent and day breaks. He must reflect in the same way, and if he find evil and wrong states, he must make an effort to put them away. But if he discover no such states, let him live in joy and gladness, training himself. Monks, mindfulness of death when so made become so developed is very fruitful of great advantage, merging and ending in the deathless. It's the end of the sutta. So this is one of the ways uh, in which we practice mindfulness of death. Uh, for a monk, uh, because uh, in the Buddha's days, uh, monks used to live in the forests, uh, in the caves, and in the open air, etc. Then at night, uh, sometimes uh, he might think uh, there might be danger from wild animals around. There might be danger of non-humans, uh, especially at night. Uh, so he can uh, very well uh, think uh, that there is a possibility uh, that he might be killed at night. Uh, and or even some sickness uh, might make him die. So he would, he would have to reflect uh, whether there are any evil and unwholesome states in him uh, that he has not put away, then he should make an effort to put them away. Or during the daytime, uh, uh, then the chances uh, of uh, being killed, uh, not so much from non-humans, but from humans uh, and animals, etc. And he can make the same contemplation. Uh. So in the same way, uh, even though we have don't have that type of dangers, uh, there are other dangers. Uh. Of course, life nowadays uh, is much more secure than before. Uh, but still, as we go on the streets, uh, we might get knocked down in a car or we drive a car, we might get involved in an accident and die. So we still can make uh, such contempt. The point here is that uh, we must examine ourselves uh, and uh, see uh, whether we have any unwholesome states in us uh, which have to be got rid of. Uh. Otherwise, uh, if we were to die, uh, then these unwholesome states uh, would pull us down to woeful planes of existence. Uh. So sometimes uh, to understand our um, unwholesome states, uh, we have to see how people treat us sometimes uh, if we have conflicts with other people then that is a good chance uh, to learn our unwholesome states uh, because sometimes it's not easy for us to un admit uh, the unwholesome states uh, the defects in our character but other people can see them and when other people see them and don't like it then uh, uh, they cause problems for us and that is a good way uh, to understand uh, our weaknesses uh.